Welcome back into our class BI 180 on First Book of Timothy, and we're talking, and, and this class is specifically responding to a lot of questions and dealing with the issue of deacons and women in the ministry. What are the qualifications for deacons and women in the ministry? This is our sixth class, and we want to go back to First Timothy chapter 3. Let's put this in its proper context, and remember, I want, I'm welcoming in all the pastors from the 19 different countries that are tuning in. Yes, over this past weekend, I received all of your questions, and we're going to go back and put them in. We're going to, put, we're going to respond to those questions contextually inside of this particular teaching. <clears throat> And remember, I'm teaching out of the New American Standard Bible, which is the NASB version. And since we have a lot of languages, a lot of dialects, just follow along with me. Let's go back into our study here with regard to deacons. Uh, let's pick this up in verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 8 to 13. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued, or addicted to too, too much wine, or fond of sordid gain but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and a great confidence, and a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And since we received a lot of questions with regard to our last class, I want to pick that up as we transition and move on to the next subject area. But before we do that, I want to go back because I have a number of questions that were asked specifically about this verse here in verse, in verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not insincere. And then it says, not prone to drink much wine. Now, that's, that's where the questions come in. Not prone to drink much wine, not greedy for money. In the Amplified Version of the Bible, it says deacons must likewise must be men worthy of respect, honorable, financially ethical, of good character, <clears throat> not double-tongued, speakers of half-truths, not addicted to wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. In the NIV Version, the New International Version, it says in the same way deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. Now, uh, let's let's put this in its proper context because I said this the last time, and I want to I want to go back and I want to repeat it again. Who wants to be waited on by a waiter at a restaurant? Okay, who is drunk, and who badges you and is badgering you and badgering you for bigger tips, or tries to convince you to order more so that the restaurant will profit more, the profits will go up? Okay, who wants to do that? Yeah. You know what you want, you know what you don't want, and the, and the waiter should respect that at least. Okay? But who wants to go through that experience? Now, I've had those experiences, okay? And you just, you know, you either have to just not personalize it, you don't have to ignore it, or just get up and leave. Mm -hmm. Now, having an intoxicated person, okay, fumbling around you and breathing this fermented drink on you, okay, as you order, is just simply not a pleasant dining experience. Would you not agree? Okay. Nor is it pleasant to receive poor service because the waiter judges you by assuming you that you that you by assuming that you're not going to leave a generous tip and so forth and so forth. Okay. Now we use that metaphor, we use that analogy because <clears throat> you certainly don't want a deacon, uh, okay, ministering to people into the local church, into the body of Christ, into their homes who's drunk. That, this is not this is not rocket science. This is not complicated. This is not nuclear science. Okay. And so I want to make sure you understand that. Now, look at what Paul is instructing Timothy to do here, okay? He, 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 says, he says that deacons are not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain, right? Like elders, right? Deacons should be sober and self-controlled, and they should not be people who take advantage of others for their own profit and their own benefit. I think I think this is very 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 clear. Remember that the deacon yeah, and his wife, okay, you are you are 
are placed in a in a very delicate situation where you're constantly going amongst you you you're involved and moving about amongst the body the local body you're in and out of their homes you're ministering you're coming into a state of conflict you're coming into into a state of a lot of personal information which you're simply not allowed to share but you're going to minister to these people so you have to you have to be sober and self-controlled that's the emphasis i want to put sober and self-control now <clears throat> It's interesting because in the King James Version of the Bible, okay, uh, it says that the deacons should not be given too, too much wine, okay, but that the elders are not given too wine, okay, as if the old James wanted elders but not the deacons to be abstinent, okay. Perhaps his elders drove the deacons to drink. I, I, I have no idea, okay. In any case, neither office should be people, con in other words, here's the point. In either case, and you know, and, and deacons go crazy with pastors who uh, who are dictators. They go crazy with pastors who are so passive they get run over, and it's a frustrating experience. It's a very frustrating experience to work with a pastor who is so passive, who, who who's not definitive and doesn't take a stand on issues, okay? and basically has no control or no leadership. Others around him are, have the control and the leadership. And if you're the deacon and operating as a biblical deacon, that's a very frustrating experience. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's what drives them. Maybe those two extremes is what drives the deacon to drink. Okay? I, I have no idea. But here's the point. Here's the point, okay? Okay? And that is this. That nobody, whether you're the elder or the deacon, should you should be. You should be people who are who are who are to be controlled, okay? You should never be controlled and you should never be ruined by the grape okay by the well, that's why he says too much wine okay now now the scriptures okay and very clearly you can see this in the old testament very clearly you can see in the new testament okay it does not command you it, it, it doesn't tell you not to drink it tells you not to get drunk okay that's the point here okay in other words not to be controlled by this okay? Th this is very 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 clear right now Okay. And deacons also should not be greedy or after filthy lucre. That, that because we just saw that here in verse eight, okay, and, and that's the way the King James version puts it. I happen to like the way the King James version puts it. Okay, in other words, it, it, in other words, what it's doing is bringing out something of the ugliness of the disposition. In the NIV version, it says pursuing dishonest gain, pursuing dishonest gain. Now, now, that sounds more polite, but such a quality is nothing other than greed for filthy lucre. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear about that. So it's particularly important, underscore, it's particularly important to avoid this quality in deacons since they will have intimate access to the lives of many people in the congregation, particularly the vulnerable ones, okay, whom they will be called upon to help. So the missions of deacons, after all, is to care for the practical concerns of the body, which often involves benevolence. And that's a, you know, that's an absolutely terrible platform to give to someone who will exploit others for his or own gain. So, so deacons have, have to be men of above reproach. They just have to be. You have access to a lot of information that many times the elder or the pastor doesn't have because you're the one who's involved at this level in the implementation of the practical teaching and preaching that comes across that pulpit into the lives of a congregation. I can't seem to stress that enough. So you cannot be under, you have, that's the reason why you have to be sober and self-controlled and you can't be influenced by anything else. So here comes some questions, okay, and observations, okay, and I love the way um, I know really he, he he puts it, okay, okay. Does the potential drink uh, does the potential deacon drink alcohol? It's a simple question. This is not, in other words, okay, okay. You know, is he a person who who's hitting that bottle all the time, okay, and completely out of control? Mm -hmm. That's you need to ask that, that. That has to be a you know it has to be a fundamentally simple question. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be insulted or offended because if they ask you that question. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear about that, okay? If so, have you, if, if, if he's 
uh, under the influence, okay? And he and his life is being controlled by the drink, okay? Okay. The question is, have you and others observed self-control in his use of that alcohol? Or does he exhibit weaknesses or sinfulness in this area? You need to ask that question. If you want to know if he is capable of saying no when he's offered alcohol, okay, does he use, in other words, does he use his freedom? Does he use his freedom in this area in a way that avoid causing, uh, causing others to stumble, okay? Being aware of the newer or the weaker Christians, okay? Would you be comfortable, okay, holding the deacon out as a model for how to responsibly use or abstain from the use of alcohol? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of good, okay, is done in life by others when they have leaders and they have teachers who model the ability to live free of addictions and compulsions. That's where the emphasis is. Right? That's what the emphasis is in all this. Okay? So uh, you, you need to be, and, and right now I'm responding to a lot of questions in this particular area, okay? Here's the second question. Does the potential deacon exhibit, does he exhibit godly generosity and self-denial or greed in his or her personal financial matters? Did you hear the question? Does the potential deacon exhibit godly generosity and self-denial? See, those things go hand in hand. Godly generosity and generosity and self-denial, they go hand in hand, or greed in his personal financial matters, okay? In other words, would you characterize the deacon as a person who is a generous giver or a hoarder of money? Is he a tightwad? Okay. You are looking for people who are stewards, who are good stewards of their resources in keeping with the priority of the kingdom rather than with the desire for personal gain. Do you understand that? These things are measurable and they're tangible. They're observable. Hmm? Here's, the, here's the third question. Does the potential deacon encourage others in generosity? Or does he foster selfishness, and financial concern in others. Look, for instance, for instance, you might consider, you might consider whether, the, whether he grumbles about the church finances or encourages giving and unity in the financial matters. Which, what, what is he known for? Hmm? Is he always grumbling about the church finances, okay? Or is he encouraging people to, in the state of unity with regard to financial matters in the church? Okay? You might consider whether he is willing to invest in missions and the gospel ministry, or if he clamors and clamors and clamors and clamors about building concerns and financial security. And this is where the majority of deacons find themselves. <coughs> because the church, the elders, and the pastors to, uh, seem to exhibit no clue whatsoever of the role of a true biblical deacon. If the only thing he's concerned about is painting the walls, changing the carpet, okay, the only thing he's concerned about is the financial matters, okay, then he, let me tell you, 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 you got the wrong person in the, in, in the wrong, in, okay, in the wrong position. This is the speaking. Deacons should not be people who invariably tend toward building bigger barns, no, there should be people about building the body of Christ, building the body of Christ. That's where they are. But many churches, the only reason why they have deacons, okay, is so that because they're looking for a committee of yes men to, with regard to making decisions. Hmm? Not about investing into the lives of the fold, not about investing into the lives of the sheep, not about investing into the lives of the membership so that they will go spiritually. They become yes men. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 12, just for a moment. Okay? In Luke chapter 12, I want you to go back to verses 15 all the way to verse 21. Yeah, I want to draw this out purposely. I, I, I do. I want to draw this out purposely. And I want you to see this with me. In Luke chapter 12, verses 15 down to all the way to 21. Let's start in verse 15. But he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one is affluent does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, 
the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began thinking to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and I will store my grain and my, and my goods there. And I will say to myself, You have many good stores. You, you have many goods stored, many goods stored up for many years to come. Relax, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your soul is demanded of you, and as for all that you have prepared, you will own it now. Such is the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich in relation to. Okay, look. In relation to God. Look. And so many churches okay, have a complete misapplication of the functionality of the role of a biblical deacon. They got them running around, okay, always looking at, well, well you know, we got to fix that window, we got to fix that door, and we got and we got to replace this with that. And, and it's always about putting a lot of money into a building, okay? That, that, that's where the majority of people are concerned about. It's about securing a bigger bank account for the church for financial security. And so what they wind up doing is they, they wind up demonstrating, they wind up giving evidence, manifesting that they have no faith in God. Absolutely nothing. It's all tangible. It's all terrenal. It's all terrestrial. It's all earthly. You learn to invest in people. Invest in the ministry, not places. The place will take care of itself if you invest in people first. Is his concern about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is his concern about local evangelism in the community? Is his concern about missions? Those should be the priorities of the life of the church. But unfortunately for most churches, that's not the life. That's not the priority. The priority, okay, is making sure that the color of the carpet is right and the color of the paint on the wall is right and that we got a bank account. And you and you and what you do is you, you don't believe you don't trust God. And then worse yet, the ecclesiastical structure of the church. Right? The, the structure of the church and its mission priorities, its business priorities rather. It's clearly not the gospel, and it's not missions. It's not evangelism. Mm -hmm. It's everything else but that. So what we want to do is we want to placing the cart before the horse. And you want to know why things are not going well. Well, and so I, I, what I did among, uh, among the pastors, I asked the simple questions. I sent a list of questions, and I said, well, let me ask you this question. All right? And let me give you an example of some of the questions. Okay? Of, what is your if you had which is your priority okay and and I asked the pastors it, it was a simple question we didn't get into a, a, a lot of details about it because they already understood they understood the foundation of the question they understood the background of the question and so I said well if you have to choose to fund a choir director um, you have to choose to fund okay a praise leader okay? you have to choose to fund a deacon which of the two would you fund? And this was the most interesting, okay, response that I received. All right? Are you ready? 87%. 87% said they will fund a, they will fund a praise team, they will fund a praise leader, they will fund a choir director before they were even considered funding a deacon. I said, wow. So here's, here's the challenge. The church is more more concerned about entertaining the people and not training the people. The choir director, okay, the praise leader, okay, is not an office of the church. The deacon is an office of the church. Did you hear what I said? The deacon is the second office of the church. If you get a good man, an older man, with a wife, okay, and they're, and they're mature in the Word of God, those people are in and out of homes, in and out of homes, in and out of homes, building the local body of Christ. Because what they're doing is they're sowing and sowing and sowing and showing and cultivating what you're preaching and teaching over the pulpit. Now just imagine this. And what the and among the responses from a, of a lot of pastors was, 
Well, we will give, for, for, let me give you an example, in North America, okay, in North America, right? I live in South America, but let me give you an example, okay, in North America. Many churches will give a mileage stipend, a stipend. They will give so much mileage for the choir director to drive up and, and do the practices and make sure that he's there on Sunday or the, or the, or the, or the praise leader and, and make sure that he has you know everything that he needs in order to conduct the, the, the musical portion of the worship service. Mm -hmm. and, and they'll do that. And yet the second officer, the deacon and his wife, are going in and out of home spending a lot of gas money and they won't provide them any gas money to go in their homes, okay, to minister to the heart in a very practical way what you, preacher, are teaching and preaching from the pulpit. It seems to me that our priorities are skewed. We're off base completely. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? If truth be told, churches will rather fund a choir director a praise team leader, mm -hmm. and, and all the music portion, okay, and zero to somebody who's going to be ministering to the heart of these men and women in the congregation. Listen, those who are rich toward God in giving, okay, in giving beyond what they what they and the church are able, okay, let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Look at this with me. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, let's look at this starting down, um, I mean 7. So let me turn to my Bible over to verse, chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and look at this in verses 1 through 5. I repeat, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5, it says, Now, brothers, verse 1, Now, brothers and sisters, we make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great deal of affliction, Okay, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflow in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave voluntarily, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints, and this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Now, you need to understand the background of this. Okay? And the background of this, it has to do with this issue. And that is, that the um, that the church, okay, in Second Corinthians, when you start in verse uh, chapter eight, verses one, okay, okay, this is the church that was in Macedonia, okay. Macedonia is the northern part of Greece. Achaia is the southern part of Greece. Okay, the Corinthian church was located in the in the in the uh, in Achaia in the southern region. The the Macedonian churches, which would have been the church of Philippi, Thessalonica, and so forth, those were the churches up in northern in, in northern Greece. And and now out of the entire Roman Empire, okay, all the way from Jerusalem, all the way to Rome, okay, north and south to the to the northern to North Africa, okay, to the southern part of of Europe, and then uh, of, of 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 Eastern Europe, all the way across to Western Europe. Mm -hmm. You'll see that that's the Roman Empire. That's how that's huge. That's mega. Hmm? Now the richest church in the Roman Empire was the Corinthian church. The poorest church in the Roman Empire was the Philippian church. Okay, all right, and that was the church in Thessalonica and 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 and, and Philippos right? up there. Now persecution had already broken out at this point in time, at the writing of Second Corinthians, and the and the and the believers were suffering greatly. They were suffering greatly. In fact, it became, it became an official edict or a decree, if you will, from Rome okay, that the Christians in the northern part in Macedonia, okay, they, 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 they lost their homes. They, 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 literally, they, their homes were taken away from them. Okay? They were thrown in the streets. They lost their employment for being believers. Now, what complicates this whole issue is that what's behind that was that you have to understand that Macedonia, that area up there, Thessalonica, Philippos, all that up there, right? that was the headquarters for Alexander the Great, right? the young general who defeated. In fact, he's the only general okay, who defeated a Roman army. Rome vowed and vowed that they would take revenge one day. Okay? They were utterly defeated by Alexander the Great. That was the headquarters 
of Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander the Great, he dies, okay? Uh, his generals take over. There's a fight among them, and they get divided, and so forth, okay? But with time, the Roman army builds up, builds up again, okay? A number of years go by, and the Roman army comes back, okay? And it, and it vow to destroy Macedonia, and that's exactly what they do. This is where these Christians were. Now, in, we just read verses 1 through 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, okay? And it says in verse 2, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. So these people who were living in the streets, okay, and they were, they, they were reduced to beggars, okay? they were the only ones, okay, the, okay, that supported all of the missions and the gospel efforts of the Apostle Paul. They didn't have a building. Today we have these beautiful buildings. They're remodeled. They're cute. And I mean, they just and, and, and I love them. Okay, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. But they're empty. And they say, and they got people sitting there with their arms crossed, doing absolutely nothing. Okay. They were not controlled by the money. They were controlled by the Spirit of God to give and to serve the Lord, not holding anything back. Now, here's the fourth question. Does the potential deacon demonstrate pastoral care? Does the potential deacon demonstrate pastoral care and self-sacrifice when interacting with others in need? See, the church is filled with a lot of men who got the title of deacon, but they don't deacon. Does the potential deacon tame to, does he tend to blame others for their financial straits, or does he primarily minister to them even when the admonishment and the rebuke is needed. You know that most of the people you're going to visit, they messed up. And yet you're going to have to talk to them. You're going to have to exhort them. That, that, that is true. But are you still willing to minister love into them? See, a blaming and punishing spirit aren't, fill, aren't fitting for someone whose basic task is to solve problems and help others in difficulty. You know, you're going to have to bite your lip and help them. You're going to have, that's what you're, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to help them. Okay? Now, with such a person... Each occasion to help will be embittering and harmful to the ones who need help. Okay. So you need to make sure that this deacon understands. Yep, these people messed this thing up royally, big time. But let me show you what the Word of God says, and let me show you how to get out of this mess that you're in by being faithful to God and trusting God. Okay. Fifth question. Is the potential deacon honest in his own financial dealings. Is the potential deacon honest in his own financial dealings? Does he pay his bills on time? Does he report accurately on his tax returns for those who are involved in a country where they have taxes? Hmm? Is the person willing to play, fudge, lie, misrepresent a little, Whenever the church's business requires sacrifice or large expenditures. A deacon has to be a good witness for Christ in his church so that and 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 so honesty and integrity in all of his dealings are absolutely essential. These are non-negotiables. Here's the sixth question. What is the potential deacon's attitude toward wealth? I mean, I don't know what it is. Okay. So look, whether a person is wealthy isn't the issue. That's not the issue here. So please don't misunderstand. Okay? A person can be greedy for dishonest gain for dishonest gain while living in a hut, in a hole, in a cave, or living in a palace. Greed lives in the heart of the poor as well as the wealthy. Does he have what is his attitude toward? Okay? So consider whether the potential deacon embodies the wisdom of Agur when he said this. Agur, A-G-A-G-U-R, okay? And you go, who's that? Well, let me show you that. Proverbs chapter 30. Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 30. And in Proverbs chapter 30, I want you to see this in verse 7, 8, and 9. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7, 8, and 9. It says this. Two things I've asked of you. Do not refuse, to, do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is my portion. 
so that I will not so so that I will not be full of a fool and deny you and say who is the Lord and that I will not become impoverished and steal and profane the name of my God you need to ask these questions does the man know how to live in much and how to live in little does the man know how to abound in much and how to be abased? Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, look what he says in verse 8. Verse 8, look. And God is able to, I'm sorry, he says, And God is able to make all grace overflow you, overflow to you, so that always having all what? Always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Are you a man who's just simply content? I have when I have, and when I don't have, I don't have. Have I learned not to fret, get bent out of shape when I don't have? Have I? Have I learned to be content when I do have? Go to open your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And in Philippians chapter 4, drop down to verse 11, 12, and 13. Verses 11, 12, and 13, Philippians chapter 4. He says, Not that I speak from need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with little. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any every circumstance, I have learned the seek I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Can I I can do all things through him who strengthens me? This is this must be a manifestation evidenced in the life of a deacon. Deacon, does he hold all things loosely? Or does he have a miser grip on it? A deacon who knows how to be content in whatever situation, as Paul puts it, will be a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous asset in teaching and modeling the contentment for others in the body. Look, I, I recently enjoyed a, 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 um, a wonderful meal at a, a, at a rather average restaurant, okay? And the atmosphere was okay, okay? The food was only slightly above average, okay? You know what made the meal great? You know what made the, the what made great the dining experience? It was the server. The server. She seemed to anticipate our needs and to respond with just the right solution. We did not need to wait or summon her, and yet she did not linger over us either. She seemed to care about our experience and even asked about our personal well being. She waited for answers and and and, 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 and replied in grace. When we left the restaurant, we felt noticed, cared for, encouraged. We never felt as if we were just a means to a tip, okay, or an inconvenience. We felt served by someone who, was, who enjoys serving. This is how a congregation should feel as the deacons care for its needs. Now, let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want you to see this, okay? Okay? I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, okay? And now, I want to I, 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 I wanna, I wanna get very specifically to the second major point. Now, it's taking us six classes to get to point number two, okay? And that is this. The deacons must meet three very important spiritual qualifications. Now, we spent all this time talking about personal qualifications. That's what we're talking about personal qualifications. Now let's move to the realm of the spiritual qualifications of a deacon. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says in verse 9 and 10. Repeat. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. He says, But holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, these men must also first be tested, then have them serve as deacons if they are, if they are beyond reproach. In the Amplified Version of the Bible, verse 9 and 10, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 
but upholding and fully understanding the mystery, that is, the true doctrine of the Christian faith with a clear conscience, resulting from behavior consistent with mature, with spiritual maturity. Did you hear that? Resulting from behavior consistent with spiritual maturity. These men must first be tested, then if they are found to be blameless and beyond reproach in their Christian lives, let them serve as deacons. So number one, deacons must hold to the mystery of the faith and hold it in good conscience. Number two, the mystery of the faith is given to us here. Now, turn your back in that same chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 3, drop all the way down to verse 16. Drop just down to verse 16. It says, 1 Timothy 3, 16, Beyond question, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed, look at this, believed on in the world and taken up in glory. Do you see that? Go back, look at this very carefully. Deacon, this is your spiritual life. Go back, look at this very carefully. Beyond question is the mystery of godliness. Verse 16. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit was seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on the world, and taken them to glory. Do you believe that? Do you have any idea what it says? Can you explain that? Can you live by that? In the Amplified Version of the Bible, go back, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And great, we confess, is the mystery, the hidden truth of godliness. He, Jesus Christ, who was revealed in human flesh, was and was vindicated in the spirit, okay, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed in the world, and taken them in glory. See, in other words, a deacon must believe, he must believe in the incarnation, in the incarnation, in the glorious gospel that God has come to earth in the person of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To do what? To preach the, to preach the love and the salvation of God for man. In fact, Note what this verse says. A deacon must hold within his own heart the mystery of the faith. The mystery of the faith. Now, I'm amazed. And I deal with a lot of churches. And so I've seen a lot of different ecclesiastical structures, a lot of church structures, and a lot of governance, okay? And I'm, and I'm always and I'm always interested in finding out who are the deacons in the church? Pastor, you know, we're going to have lunch. Can we have lunch with your deacons? Uh, or why? Because I'm going to do a spiritual assessment of your church. It's not through you, not what you say to me, not through your choir director, not through your praise team leader, not to the people who like to perform on the platform. I, mean, I, I, I like to find out about your deacons. You discover the true spirituality of the church. And I'm amazed how many deacons are incapable of explaining the gospel. Explaining the gospel of Jesus Christ and modeling that gospel of Jesus Christ into the life of the congregation. The deacon, he must possess and cling to the mystery of the faith. He must hold it in good conscience. He must believe the whole gospel, the mystery, and not deceive the church by being hypocritical by about his own belief. There is another point about the conscience as well. The deacon must have a good conscience about living and sharing the mystery of the faith. He must not accept the call and the office of deacon and then shirk and disregard his duties and his responsibilities. He must hold the mystery of the gospel of the faith in all good conscience, that is, in sharing it faithfully with both believers and unbelievers. So, deacon, if your wife is not a believer, your wife does not participate in the life of the church, you shouldn't be a deacon. You're lying. And worse yet, the pastors and the elders are allowing you to get away with that. They're lying and misrepresenting the truth before the congregation. Turn your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 
Please turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 says, For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in, our, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have, construct, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. Stay with me there. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Go back, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and look at this in, verses, in verse 5. Yes, verse 5. He says, <clears throat> But the goal of our instruction is, is, a, is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. When I look at the deacon in your church, can I see that in his life? Can I see that truly in his life? Yes or no? It's not if, and, or but. Hmm? Stay with me. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Go down to verse 19. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. So let's turn on. Let's go there. And look at this. He says, Keeping faith in a good conscience which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck and in regard to in regard to their faith. I, I'm just aghast, amazed, stunned, overwhelmed. I am simply stupefied as I see a lot of failed deacons and the pastors and the elders allow this to take place. And worse yet, the church allows it. This is the second office of the church. With all due respect, it's not the choir director, it's not the praise team leader, it's the deacon. That's the second office charged by the word of God to implement what is being faithfully taught and preached from that pulpit into the practical life of the congregation. This requires a mature man with a mature wife. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, let's look at this in verse 16, please. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing which you are slandered, those who disparage your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Oh, let me tell you something, Deacon. Church members will run at the mouth about you. They will run at the mouth about you. They will. If they have no gumption, they have no, they, they have no shame to do it about the pastor and the elders, trust me, they'll do it about you. Okay. So you need to understand, deacons must first be proved or tested before they're called to the office of deacon. Okay. Now, keeps, you have, the deacon has to prove that he keeps whole, that he keeps a whole, a whole to the faith. Go back to verse 9. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 9. But holding to the mystery, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. In the Amplified Version, but upholding and fully understanding the mystery, that is the true doctrine of the Christian faith, which is a clear conscience resulting, it says, resulting from what? Resulting from, be, resulting from behavior consistent with spiritual maturity. Now, I have an occasion, uh, I have an occasional ritual when visiting restaurants, okay? Especially restaurants I don't know very well, okay? I like to have the waiter, sometimes I ask the waiter, what do you recommend? What do you recommend? Okay? I like to have the waiter sometimes just, just surprise me with whatever he or she thinks I will enjoy eating, okay? Now, now, what happened, I remember this years ago, the ritual started when some of the co-workers and I went to a restaurant following, it, it was just one of those excruciating long day of meetings and decision making and so forth and so forth. And I, I, I just simply didn't want, I didn't have another decision left for me to make. I'm just, I'm just hungry. I'm sorry, I'm just hungry. I don't want to make another decision, okay? So, I had this beautiful menu in my hand, okay? Okay? 
and I handed this beautiful full color menu of mouth watering, okay, to the uh, 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 pictures to the waitress and asked, "Could you please order something for me?" She looked at me. Now, I mean, I, I, I mean, I eat everything, okay. I'm an omnivore. Omni, you know, all, I just, I eat everything. You know, I, I, you know I, and I said, look, listen to me. So there isn't much probability of disappointing me, okay? I'm willing to eat anything, okay? Now, after some surprise and hesitation, okay, the waitress returned with this great meal, scrumptious meal, okay? And she spared me the agony of another decision that day, and a new personal ritual was born, okay? And so I said, listen, I tell you what, I promise that whatever you bring to me, since I'm asking, I'm, I'm asking for it, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting you, right? I promise that I'm not going to be disappointed, and I'm not going to return that meal, and I'm not going to get angry. I'll eat it. Good, bad, and different. I'm going to eat it. Okay. And you know, after so many years of doing this, okay, I can only honestly say about two different incidences, okay, where a waiter delivers something just really, really disappointing, okay. Once there was this busy day, like the first day of the ritual develop, okay, I told a young man that I had a ravenous craving for red meat, okay, and he, so he brought me this large plate of shrimp and grits, okay. I remember this, you know. Now, I know shrimp and grits, okay, is a South Carolina low country delicacy, you know, I mean, you know, but there's no way to adequately refuel my tank with porridge and sea scavengers. I mean, I was hungry, okay. My jaw nearly hit the table when my when my eyes just fastened on this meal. Hmm? Now, to relieve my servers of too much pressure, I assure them okay, that I will eat contently and gratefully whatever they bring. Okay, so when the shrimp and the grits arrived, I gave thanks to the Lord and I enjoyed the dish. I mean, I did. Okay, I mean, I was ready for a big old double double mac hamburger after that. Okay. I mean, this entire, in other words, this entire ordering uh, philosophy rests on a simple fact. The waiter or the waitress should know the menu and the kitchen far better than I do. Their knowledge of, the, of what the chef cooks well, what customers appreciate, and what the ingredients are available to make the delicious meal either makes it, okay, either makes this a great strategy or, 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 or a grand adventure in culinary foolery, okay? But as I said, I have I have worn a dunce cap twice during my meal. Waiters and waitresses generally know their product. They know their product. If they've been there a while, they know their product. Let me tell you something. A biblical deacon knows his word. He knows the word of God. He knows what plate to serve in that situation when he goes into that home and sees what's developing and taking place in that home. I'm going to have to trust him. I am going to have to trust him. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Yes or no.